Greetings. This talk is about the Holy Grail, the most mysterious, perhaps, of all such subjects. Everybody knows what the Holy Grail is, but strangely, no one seems to know what the Holy Grail is. In this talk, I'm going to give you what I believe to be the secret meaning of the Holy Grail. Now, you may ask what authority I am speaking on. Well, I'm speaking on my own authority, which means that your acceptance of it has purely to do with your own authority. You give authority to anything outside. And that's whether that's me, whether that's Bibles, churches, popes, doctrines, whatever. If you give authority to something, it's you who's doing the giving. Never forget that. If you remember nothing from the rest of this talk, remember that. So, the Holy Grail. Well, it's something kind of unattainable. You kind of know what it is, except maybe you don't really know what it is. There's a huge amount of lore and art around it, even a Monty Python film. Uh, and some of the art is quite beautiful and inspirational. Here's one where the uh, grail is shown as, well, receiving the scent of the spirit from on high in the form of the light and of the white dove, which is usually equated with the Holy Spirit. Here's another one. This is, I, this, this is, I believe, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti in 19th century England. You'll see that a lot of the art around the grail comes not from the Middle Ages, where the Grail legend originated, but from the Romantic era in England, that is to say, the beginning of the 19th century on. And that's because in this era, there was a great interest and resurgence of interest in England and Britain uh, in these old chivalric myths, including the myths and legends around King Arthur. Now, King Arthur is probably based on a historical figure who was actually a ruler in fifth century Britain. But all of the stories you know, the, the Round Table and Sir Lancelot and Guinevere and all that, probably had very little, if anything, to do with what was really going on. Now, part of this whole Arthurian cycle, which is called the Matter of Britain, does include the grail. At one point, the grail appears to the Knights of the Round Table, and they go all off in search of it. Well, uh, none of them find it except maybe one. And we'll see why. Nevertheless, the origins of the grail story itself did not originate in this Arthurian cycle. Where it comes from originally, we don't know. But the best guess is that it arises in ancient Celtic myths, particularly of the Welsh and the Irish and the Bretons. The Bretons live on the very northwest uh, peninsula of France, and they speak a Celtic language. And it is believed that this legend came down and became incorporated into medieval literature. The grail, what does it mean? Well, this is the best guess. It comes from the old French gradal or grau, and it means something like serving platter, which is not the way people usually think of the, with a grail. It's usually seen as kind of a cup. 
But the fact that it's a serving platter has a certain symbolism of its own, which I believe is relevant and which we'll get to. Now, the first person to bring us the Grail legend in its present form was Chrétien de Troyes, who has uh, lived, oh, when did he live? Well, around this time, FL. Well, that means flourished. That means they have no idea really when he was born or died, but when they give this date, he was kind of at his prime, usually assumed to be around the age of 40 uh, during these years. And that's about as far as we can go. And he wrote a romance called the Perceval. This was the uh, last thing he wrote and uh, doesn't seem to have completed it. And I'll give you the story in a very attenuated form. Percival is a young man who sets out uh, to find the world, to discover the world, and he leaves his mother. And his mother gives him various pieces of advice, one of which is, uh, it's rude to talk too much, don't talk too much. And he goes through all sorts of various adventures, and at the end, he's in this very kind of desolate country. And he comes to a riverbank, and he spies a man fishing in a boat. And Percival says to this man, do you know some place where I could take refuge around here? And the man says, well, if you go to the top of that hill, you will see a castle where you can find refuge. So Percival goes laboriously up to the top of this hill, looks around and sees nothing. I said, oh, that old man deceived me. But actually he looks again and there is in the distance uh, a very handsome looking castle. So he goes to it and the castle is beautiful, richly appointed. When he approaches, the, moat, uh, the drawbridge comes down over the moat, men come out, they escort him in, they take his armor, they take his horse, give it oats and uh, whatever else horses eat, and escort him in to a hall. And in this hall is a king sitting or lying. And this king says, you are very welcome. I'm very glad you have come. Excuse me, but I can't really stand, uh, it's, it's, not very, it's not really possible for me to stand these days, so I can't greet you uh, standing up. So he sits Percival down, and this lavish banquet begins to be served with all sorts of meats, delicacies, uh, exotic things from places like uh, the Near East, which was a faraway world, and plenty of mead and other good things to drink. And then, I'm gonna read this from actually the original. As they spoke of one thing and another, there came out of a chamber a youth who held a white lance gripped in the middle. He passed between the fire and the ones who were sitting on the bed. And all who were there saw the white lance and the white iron. A drop of blood issued from the iron head of the lance and that crimson drop trickled down to the hand of the youth. The young man, who had only arrived that night, beholds this marvel, but held back from asking how this thing might be. Because he's been told, who talks too much commits a sin. Qui trop parole péché fait, in the language of the old French. 
Then there came two more youths who held in their hands candelabra of fine gold worked with enamel. The youths who carried the candelabra were very handsome. Each candelabrum burned at least 10 candles. A damsel who came with the youths, beautiful and noble and well adorned, held a grail in her hands. When she had entered together with the grail she had carried, there came so great a light that the candles lost their brightness as the stars do when the sun or moon rise. After her came a girl who held a carving dish of silver. The grail which went in front was of pure refined gold. The grail had precious stones of many kinds, the richest and costliest by sea and land. Without doubt, these stones of the grail surpassed all others. They passed before the bed just as the lance had passed, going from one chamber into another. And the young man saw them pass, but did not at all dare to ask whom one served with the grail. He had always heard, uh, had always in his heart the words of the wise nobleman who also had said that uh, it's a sin to talk too much. Finally, the king says, you must excuse me, I have to go to bed, but you can sleep here in the hall. And the king goes to bed, the young man goes to sleep in the hall, thinking, you know, I'm really curious about that lance and grail. I'll just ask somebody before I leave tomorrow. Well, he wakes up and there's nobody there. His armor, all shined, is laid out for him. He puts it on, it goes, he finds his horse, all groomed, curried, saddled, ready to go, but there's nobody there. And he finds this extraordinarily bewildering. So he goes on, and as he travels, he encounters a young woman. And the young woman said, this is very desolate country. But, you know, you seem very well groomed and well fed, and your horse is certainly well groomed. Where did you stay? He said, well, I stayed at this really beautiful castle, you know, way back. <sighs> that was the castle of the Fisher King, she said. The Fisher King? Yeah. He's been wounded through the thighs. And he can't walk. So he can't hunt or do falconry or do any of the other sports real kings do. But he eventually goes out on a boat to fish, which is about the best he can do. What else did you see? Well, I saw this strange procession with this bleeding lance and this grail. Did you ask what they were for? No, I, I meant to, I was gonna ask somebody the next day, but nobody was around. She said, that's a real misfortune. If you would ask those questions, the king would have been healed and the land, the wasteland around it, would have been restored. But now it's over, it's all done. Uh, that's not gonna happen and great misfortune will result. And that is the basic story of the original grail as told by Chrétien de Troyes, circa 1180. Chrétien's story captured the imagination of Europe very quickly. And in the next generation or two, there's a proliferation of grail literature throughout Europe, much of which elaborated and diverged greatly from the basic myth that I've just given you. Uh, the German writer, poet, Wolfram von Eschenbach wrote his own account. 
in which the grail is not a cup but a stone. It's called the lapsit exilis. Now, this sounds Latin, but it actually doesn't mean anything in Latin. Well, there's lapsus, fallen, lapis, stone. Exilis means something like kind of thin or meager or on and on. Uh, maybe Wolfram didn't know Latin that well. Maybe he wanted to keep it very mysterious with a word that had associations but didn't have an easily discernible meaning. This version of legend said that the stone fell from the crown of Lucifer when he fell from heaven. And there are many, many other stories of this kind. And this, they all proliferated very soon, a generation or so, after the time of Chrétien de Troyes. Eventually, they got mixed in to the Arthurian uh, literature, as I just said. And a great deal of other lore began to accumulate around it. Some of this had to do with Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea appears in the Gospels very briefly as the man who gets custody of Christ's body after his crucifixion and lays it in a tomb which most people assume was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Now that is as much as the New Testament says. But a great deal of lore accumulated around Joseph too. One was that, well one actually said that he was a tin merchant. And Britain produced a lot of tin in those days and there was a trade between Britain and the Roman Empire uh, in tin. And so one of the legends said he was a tin merchant that took tin from Britain to Phoenicia. Others say, in addition to that, that after Christ's death and resurrection, he went off on his own and ended up in Britain. And this part of Britain Britain was not at the time, or Britain was just about to be conquered by the Roman Empire, by the way, which is another story. But he went to this part of Britain, which is in the southwest of England today, Somersetshire, and the place most associated with him is Glastonbury. Now, Glastonbury itself is a very sacred site, and it is kind of the, the New Age mecca of the British world. Here's Glastonbury Tor. A tor is a hill, but it's an artificial hill. And like most of these tors, if not all of them, these were built before the present day inhabitants or the ancestors of the present day inhabitants were even in England, uh, many years BC. What they were for, what they were meant to mark originally, nobody really knows. Much like Stonehenge, although of course that's not a tour. And there's a tower, a roofless tower over, I believe St. Michael's Tower, which has much lore associated with it. And the legend says that Joseph of Arimathea brought the grail, the cup, that, the cup that Christ used at the Last Supper with him. This is a slightly later version of the legend. The stained glass window shows a uh, well, you can see it here. These are cruets, little kind of pouring vases. And an earlier version of the legend says that Joseph uh, took blood and water that flowed from the wounds of Christ and had it buried with him somewhere in Glastonbury, location unknown. But the same glass window also 
uh, points out, uh, there's obviously the cup there, which is the grail. Here's a cross here uh, inv involving um, Joseph's role in um, the post-crucifixion. So that is a legend that has uh, stayed very much alive in England. And it is centered around Glastonbury. Glastonbury is uh, today a very prosperous, uh, charming, powerful place to visit. And every year hosts the Glastonbury Festival, which is probably the biggest mind, body, spirit, new age festival in Britain today. So it is far from forgotten. There's a huge amount of other lore about Glastonbury, about the Grail, and uh, there are volumes and volumes written about it, both the origins of it and the truth of it. Well, where is this Holy Grail? Well, as you might have expected, nobody ever found it. But there are candidates, the true grail. Here's one, the Glastonbury Bowl. Well, you can already see why that might be associated with the grail. It's from Somersetshire, England, which is where Glastonbury is. And it's dated from the Iron Age, which in this case is circa 250 BC. Uh, this is not seriously assumed to be the grail by anybody, much like the other specimens that I'm gonna show you. Uh, it, it, uh, I suppose it could, well, it certainly did exist at the time of Joseph of Arimathea, but it was probably made in England, which, or Britain, which was uh, certainly very far from uh, Christ and the site of the Last Supper. What happened to the real grail that Christ actually used at the Last Supper? Well, if you want to take a very flat line view of it, it probably vanished very quickly. It's even quite conceivable that the feast at the Last Supper was, may have even been a catered event. Maybe one of uh, Jesus' disciples got together and hired somebody uh, to fill a room and had somebody bring in the food. If that's so, it would be like any catered event today. You had a champagne glass at a wedding on Saturday. Which glass was it? Uh, well, even the caterer doesn't know, that, uh, you know, a day later or even that evening. Probably it was just another ordinary artifact. So probably the last thing on anyone's minds uh, would have been the correct uh, collection of, of relics. In fact, as a sideline, Christian relics didn't really start to get going as a, an enterprise until around the fourth century. This started with a mother of the Emperor Constantine, his name was Helena, who went to the uh, Holy Land and found she believed, or what she was told, was the true cross. And to this day, there are bits of this true cross all over the Catholic churches of the world, and no doubt, if you put them all together, they could um, be assembled into many true crosses. But this started the whole thing about uh, relics, sacred things. Um, I mean, there are, I believe there are two or three heads of John the Baptist scattered across the, the churches of Europe. So you can uh, see just how, uh, well, bogus this all became and how quickly. I will say something about the function of sacred relics. They do have an allure. They do have a certain power. And one can often feel these, not only in sacred temples and sites, but even sometimes in museum pieces, say a statue of a Buddha that might be uh, at your local museum or something of the kind. 
That itself is a very long and intricate story. But I will give you one piece of it. And this is a tradition that comes out of Buddhism. The story of the Buddha's tooth. Well, it seems that there was a monk who decided that he was going to make a long pilgrimage to all of the sacred sites of Buddhism, which, all of, uh, which were far away. And before his, he left, his mother said, could you please bring me back a sacred relic? And he said, oh yeah, yeah, I, I, I promise, I'll do that. So he goes away for years and years and years, goes to all sorts of places, uh, encounters all sorts of adventures and hardships, and finally starts to make his way home. At the very last village before his own, he realizes, oh my God, I didn't get my mother a relic. Well, fortunately, there happens to be a dead dog lying at the side of the road. So he pries a tooth loose from this dead dog, kind of wipes it off, puts it in his pocket, takes it home to his mother and said, Here, here's the relic you wanted. It's a tooth of the Buddha. And the mother says, oh, a, a tooth of the Buddha. Well, strangely enough, the mother starts performing all of these amazing miracles using this so-called tooth of the Buddha. And the punchline to this story is <laughs> that your belief, again, uh, the authority you give to a relic accounts for much, if not all, of its power. So much more for something that has attracted a lot of attention and allegiance. And a great deal of the reverence given to sacred relics of Christianity and any religion can be understood in this way. Here's a splendid one, the chalice of Doña Uraca, Leon, Spain. This is on display in a church in Leon, Spain. Um, I think this is onyx and it's quite elaborate and doesn't look in the slightest bit as if um, it might have been uh, created in first century Palestine. Sometimes you will see grails or specimens of grails where there's like a little silver bowl, a little simple bowl inside that, that has some elaborate uh, base put around it later just to, as a sign of veneration. But this one uh, I believe dates to uh, the Romanesque period in Spain, which in this case is probably around 1100. Nonetheless, there are people who venerate this uh, as the true grail, and if you wish to do so, well, get yourself a ticket to Lyon, Spain. Here's the one I find the most intriguing, because it's just so simple. This is the Nantius Cup. It's in the National Library of Wales, and Wales is very near Somersetshire, which is where Glastonbury is. So that's kind of intriguing. And this was in Glastonbury Abbey, which is a monastic abbey in Glastonbury, which was closed by King Henry VIII around 1535. And all the monks had to get out. And so the story goes, one of these monks got out, went to Wales nearby and said, well, you know, here is, uh, this is the actual grail that Christ used at the Last Supper. It's a little more primitive, which makes the whole thing a little more plausible. But the monk go, went wherever the monk had to go and this Welsh family uh, kept it uh, and then left it to another Welsh family and they held on to it uh, and would occasionally bring it out for healing purposes, for veneration. 
uh, apparently some of this veneration kind of ate into it uh, because everybody was touching it or something like that. Um, and story after story, it ended up in the National Library of Wales where you can see it. This too is not regarded as the authentic grail. This one uh, is, is believed to be medieval. And so it's probably from medieval Britain. Let's put, the, oh, here's one I forgot. The Chalice in Antioch. This is in uh, New York City, the Cloisters. This is at least a little closer. It's dated to um, uh, sixth century. And I believe that this is one of those that has kind of an original, much simpler cup around which a much more elaborate uh, base was built. But again, a lot later than the time of Christ. In fact, look, this crack part probably showing the original underlying vessel. So, the Holy Grail is this cup that Christ used at the Last Supper, allegedly. But what is the meaning of this grail? Here's the angel of the grail. And here it is very, very explicitly associated with uh, the chalice used in the mass. This looks like any chalice used in any Catholic mass anywhere as far as I've ever seen. So the correspondence there is very pronounced and very deliberate. Some Catholics point to one interesting detail about the time of the Grail, which was, it was around the time when the doctrine of transubstantiation became kind of codified in the Catholic Church. Now in the New Testament, Christ says, this is my body, this is my blood, what does that mean? Well. Um, was it symbolic? There was a great deal of uncertainty about this, and the, the question was left uh, really quite moot until around the dawn of the 13th century. And at that point, the church kind of got its doctrine together, uh, which was called the real presence. That is to say, the host and the wine in the Eucharist after consecrated by the priest became literally the body and blood of Christ. Now you might be able to see one or two kind of logistical problems with this argument. One being that, well, no, it actually uh, still tastes like wine. It tastes like a piece of really quite flavorless bread or unleavened bread. Another little detail, to go back to the lance, which you will remember the young man also saw at the house of the Fisher King. That may have some connection to a spear that was allegedly used by an anti Christian mob in Beirut sometime in the Middle Ages, and somebody used the spear to stick a statue of Jesus, and so the story goes, the statue bled, lance with the blood on it, and I am told that the spear is still on display in a church in Armenia, if you happen to find yourself in that direction. But now we are kind of coming to the end of exhausting the possibilities of anything like the literal meaning of the grail. Well, I did promise you the true grail secret, so I'll give it to you. It's in a way very simple, it's very obvious, it's also quite profound. All of which leads me to think that it may be very close to the truth. 
Well, let's look at this. What is this here? This cup, this chalice? Well, we just said uh, it's a cup that holds blood, right? In the Mass, the blood of Christ. It's a cup that holds blood. Think about it. Well, if you do, you realize that you have a cup that holds blood. You wouldn't last a second without it. Where is it? Here. So we could say that it is the heart. Now, to go back to another aspect of the Grail legend, as I said, most of Arthur's knights never got to see the Grail. The one who did was named Galahad. And it was because he was the only one of Arthur's knights that was pure of heart. And this purity of heart, I believe, also points to the true meaning of the grail. To put it in a sentence, the grail, at one of its profoundest levels, symbolizes the purified heart that is then illumined by influences from above. Only a pure heart can be illuminated in this way. This certainly puts a lot of the pieces of the puzzle into place. And no, your heart is not going to be uh, illuminated unless it's pure. I'm not really speaking of purity in the, the sexual sense, which was usually uh, the term uh, meaning given to it in the past. I mean, you know, how clean are your motives of all sorts? Is your heart really pure? And oh, hey, there's another little aspect to go back to something I said earlier. Hey, the grail may originally have been a serving platter. Well, how does this fit in? It fits perfectly. As does the grail question. Because the grail question that he was supposed to ask is, what does the grail serve, or who? It's all really quite obvious from what I just said. What does your heart serve? Is it something clean, honorable, decent, elevated? Or is it you know, kind of the usual run of nonsense and uh, rubbish that everybody chases after on a day-to-day -day basis, thinking that this is somehow the only way to live? Only you can answer that question, of course. But I haven't dealt with a lance, a lance that bleeds. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about it. What is a lance meant to do? It's meant to wound. But in this particular case, the lance is itself wounded. It's bleeding. What do I see as the meaning to this? You cannot wound without wounding yourself. An equally profound truth. Well, what about the Fisher King, this lame old man? And you have to remember in medieval times, fishing was, was kind of a, a really low class occupation. It was not as I said, the kind of things kings did. They went out hunting stags and falconry and that kind of thing. So a, a fisher king is a pretty pathetic specimen. 
Oh, and his land is waste. This also fits in because unless your heart is pure and illumined, you are going to be a pretty lame specimen. Your land, the land that is your world, is going to be waste. Unless you can answer that question, what does your heart serve? Is this the ultimate answer to the meaning of the grail? I don't know. These symbols never have ultimate single meanings. But I would say this is uh, the, the most profound and important and I would also say sensible explanation that I have come to. I'm speaking in the year 2022 and this happens to be the 100th anniversary of T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland. The Wasteland is based around the Grail myth. It even has a Fisher King in it and many other symbols, often obscurely stated and described, but beautifully and evocatively. In the last part, the narrator, whoever he is, is in this wasteland. Here one could neither stand nor lie nor sit, says one of the lines. And one of the legends about the, the, the Fisher King was that he actually couldn't either lie or sit, but he had to lean. Elliot was aware of all of this. The last section of the poem is called What the Thunder Said. And what it says is three Sanskrit words. Tata dayadvam damyata. Give, control, sympathize. That is what Eliot is saying will take us out of the wasteland. Eliot was writing at the end, just after the First World War, when Europe was very much a wasteland. But his poem still has resonance for our time because we can certainly feel a great deal of desolation around us. Well, you're never gonna fix the desolation around you unless you fix the desolation within. What is the line in Eliot's poem? I shall at least set my lands in order. You have to set your own lands in order. You're worried all about the world and this and that and all the other things. Uh, set your own land in order first. That, I believe, is the central message of the grail, both in its original terms and in Eliot's updated terms. As a final note, if you're interested in these subjects, I would like to suggest that you read my book, The Introduction to the Occult. And it covers many such themes like this, including, what have I got here? Atlantis, magic, UFOs, witchcraft, psychedelics, thought power. A great number of things you've heard about, but have probably heard a great deal of nonsense about. And this is a very concise, clear, and simple attempt to just get to the truth of the matter so that at least you can sort your way around if you start reading all of this literature or exploring these things. I think it's very readable and enjoyable, and I hope you'll check it out. Thank you.